welcome to the third in a series of workshops um, that, uh, that the Biology Scholars Program has been hosting. And the series overall is referred to as Expanding Undergraduate Success in STEM, EUSS. And the workshop series, as well as the Biology Scholars Program, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in just a second, uh, is, funded by, is funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So this is the 2014 grant that we got from HHMI. And the purpose of EUSS is to share the practices of the Biology Scholars Program uh, campus-wide. And so today's focus is going to be on mentoring. We've had a workshop on teaching, one on advising, and this is the third in the series on mentoring. And so I uh, just wanted to say welcome. I want to find out who's in the room. How many of you here are students here at Berkeley or elsewhere? We've got a couple of folks, three. How many of you are on staff? Raise your hands. Okay. And how many of you are faculty either here or elsewhere? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. I know some of you traveled quite a distance to be here. Uh, let's see if we can make this worth your while. And so in putting together this workshop, and I was just explaining this uh, in a conversation with Stella, uh, you know, when you do something for so long, it's, it's hard to teach it because it almost comes second nature to you. You know, it's, uh, it's something... BSP is something that I've been doing for the last 26 years, and you'll see the success data, the student outcome data. And it's really hard to take what you're doing and help share it in a way that's useful to other people. That is a really difficult thing. One of the things I didn't want to do is I didn't want to keep citing the literature, even though the literature is important, but that's not necessarily translatable. A lot of the evidence that there is out there uh, based on research uh, supports what we've been doing. But I have the practitioner in mind, whether you be a faculty member doing mentoring, excuse me, research mentoring, a college or departmental advisor, or whatever capacity you have, I want to make this useful to you. And so let me tell you uh, the overview and sort of the frame of this entire workshop. First of all, I want to make this participant-centered. You're going to be doing a lot of conversation. You're going to be taking, doing some exercises in the first hour. And you're going to be talking with each other about your mentoring perspective, your experience, your context, some of the issues, and so on. I want you to assess your starting point, where you are right now around mentoring. I think that's an important thing in order to add anything new to where you are, we have to, under, we have to establish baseline. I want to build on where you are with the BSP approach. Now, the BSP approach, of course, is within a programmatic context, and I'm trying to share it beyond the program, which means that it may or may not fit with what you do in the classroom, the laboratory, in an advising session, and so on. I know that also you, many of you are working with undergraduates, but also a number of you are working with graduate students and postdocs, and maybe even mentoring junior faculty. And so this is not a one-size-fits-all, but there are maybe some, some principles that are transferable and applicable to your population, to your context, and so on. And finally, this is modeled after the approach we take in BSP. Participant-centered, student-centered, we try to work from the individual outward. We try to build something that is meaningful, relevant to uh, the individual who is on the other side of the table, on the other side of the bench, other side of the lectern, whatever. So here's how we're going to proceed. And each of you should have two handouts. One is an outline with a number of exercises and maybe some of the major points of the talk today. And the other one is an evaluation. And so take a look at the lecture outline. So we're going to start off with BSP, the history, its components, success, and so on. And then the first exercise is going to be one called Mentor, Advisor, Teacher. And we're going to talk a little bit about, um, we're going to do a compare and contrast. And then we're going to be talking about mentoring outcomes in terms of what are called SMART goals. And some of you in the room know what that means, but I didn't before I started looking around in the literature to find out ways to explain what it is that I've been doing. 
And the second exercise is going to be about aligning expectations between mentor and mentee. And then we're going to be talking about mentoring relationships in terms of core principles. That is, principles that really kind of drive a good mentoring, men, mentor-mentee relationship. Then we're going to turn back to BSP. I'm going to talk about BSP's approach to mentoring. We're building a platform in the first half in order for you to get an, an idea of your baseline and so on, and some of the, some of the th ways to think about mentoring. And then I'm going to introduce some of the approaches we take in BSP that I believe have been really very effective in producing the student outcomes. We'll have a discussion and q and I want to leave at least half an hour or more for that, just an open discussion. You'll be talking a lot within your groups. That's the reason why we have a number of small tables, because I want you to discuss the exercises, you know, your perspectives, and so on. And then finally, we'll be doing an evaluation. That's how we're going to roll today. That's exactly how we're going to go. OK. So BSP, some of you in the room have seen this before. I apologize. But again, this is a starting point for everybody. I want to make sure everybody has a common understanding. In terms of BSP, our funding comes from the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and also from UC Berkeley. In terms of its goal, and this is really important because this is part of what we consider in our mentoring, to enlarge and diversify the pool of students who succeed in biology majors and careers. It's about enlarging the pool, not just about skimming individuals who are already on their way to success. <laughs> in terms of its members, there have been 3,500 BSP participants over the last 26 years. 3,100 have graduated. And take a look at the profile. 60% underrepresented ethnic minority, 70% women, 80% come from low income and first generation backgrounds, and most are interested in health careers. OK, that's the profile. In terms of success, really common sense metrics in terms of success. When we compare BSP minority students with non-BSP majority students, that's inside-outside comparison. The majority students are a good comparison group because you know, these are the individuals who have historically succeeded in STEM fields here at Berkeley you know, over time. So this comparison. BSP minority students enter with lower SATs and high school GPAs, yet they graduate in biology majors in the same percentage as the comparison group folks with nearly equivalent exit GPAs. They come in less well prepared to succeed, and yet they finish on par with students at large, biology majors at large. So there's parity. The equity gap has been, relatively speaking, closed. Here's the demographic of our BSP students. And this is a comparison put together by Andrew Epic from the Office of Equity and Inclusion, comparing 2002 to 2008 freshman cohorts of intended biology majors. OK, it's a big sample. BSP is in the dark blue, and all intended biology majors during that time period are in light blue. And you can see how BSP is overselected for particular demographics. We have more women than are in the larger pool. We have more underrepresented ethnic minorities. We have more first-gen students. And we also have more students from the lower half of the academic, pro academic performance index high schools, going from 1 to 10, 10 being the highest, that is schools that are really well-resourced and can support their students well, all the way down to 1. Students, excuse me, schools that, in fact, don't have the resources, may not have AP courses, may not have the facilities to well support their, their students. And about half of our students come from that lower half of those high schools. Pretty amazing. GPA, we select students coming in with a lower GPA and lower SAT scores. And so what's the takeaway message? Many people view this population of students that we've been working with over 26 years as really not Berkeley material. They think it's a problem with the admissions policy, right? That students like that would be admitted to Berkeley. Also, many individuals would say, you expect them to succeed in STEM? And I say yes. Given the right environment, 
Students from all backgrounds can succeed. And this is really sort of the, you know, the test of that, of that idea. And so what do we do? What do we do in the program? Our components are up there. It's the typical list of things that people do in their programs. This is the list. But the devil is in the implementation. And we know that. We can list things, but how we implement each and every one of those things is really, really critical. Critical to success. The devil is in the implementation, going from concept to practice. So with this program overview, I want to start off by assessing your starting point, all those things that you can read up there. That's what these exercises and conversations are all about, regarding mentoring, your experience and so on, your perspectives. And from there, we're going to build on that platform with the BSP approach. We're going to see if we can add value to what you're already doing, but we have to have a baseline to begin with. So let's start off with a really, really simple definition of mentor. I'm not going to, there are some really um, long definitions, but here's, here's a definition. A wise and trusted counselor or teacher. Wait, mentor, counselor, teacher. Hmm. A mentor is a wise and trusted counselor or, and, or teacher. Now, it, we seem to be conflating a bunch of things here. And in fact, this distinction among uh, advising, teaching, and mentoring is kind of also called into question. And some of you are advisors here. Many of you are advisors, right? Uh, whether you'd be faculty or staff advisors. There's this organization called NACADA, the National Academic Advising Association. And I found this, this bumper sticker that says, advising is teaching. Wait, <laughs> advising is teaching? OK, so are the distinctions among those three activities clear cut? And I want to find out what you think. So if we have this mentoring, advising, and teaching, this is not a continuum, but more just a listing of those three things. And if we have this scale of one to six, and this is in your handout on the first page, I want to find out where, how you would score this in terms of the following. Mentoring, advising, and teaching, if you feel like they're more similar than different, right? They kind of all kind of mush together, then I would give this a one. But if you think that they are more different than similar, I would give this a six or anything in between. Put down your score, and then after you have your score, talk to one another. Your discussion will be around your rationale for your score, for you scoring it the way you see it, okay? So please. Okay, I'm going to stop you right now. This is to be continued. Um, let me ask you just really quickly. Let me, let me do a poll. How many gave it a score of one or two? Raise your hands. Wow. Okay, what were some of the reasons? Just quickly. Single reason. Maybe somebody could just shout it out. Please. Uh, so mentoring could subsume advising and teaching, but, necessarily, but not necessarily in the other direction. Oh, it's unidirectional. How maybe, interesting. Maybe sometimes when you're teaching, you do have the opportunity for okay. mentoring and advising, but not always. I see. So oh. enough, 500% okay. Class. Okay. Okay. Scale matters. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else who did a one or two want to speak up? Please, Mika. <laughs> I thought when they're done at their best, they all happen. They all happen at the best. So when you're teaching at your best, the best teachers, you know, discipline advisors, the best mentors, Can every, could everybody hear that? Mm -hmm. So at their best, when they're getting started. OK, at their best. OK, OK. I'm actually going to say, so, but, but back to these huge classes, right? <coughs> you, you could end up being a mentoring advisor to a small select group that come to you. But for the, the rest of the, the vast majority, I don't see how that, that would work. I, I, I say I would agree with that. <laughs> 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 I think that the mentoring is also a class and a huge class. And I would say. Interesting. What about at the other end? How many people scored at a five or six? Okay, well, you got the answer right. <laughs> so maybe you can say why? Um, I, I agree that when they're done at their best, they should all kind of flow into each other. But yes. I think it's hard 
especially at such a large institution with such big classes so to scale. have. Yeah, I think scale is the issue. So that's okay. Why I put it. So if we were at a smaller place where maybe there were 20 students in the class and yeah, and we knew everybody. Okay, okay. Over here. I agree with her. I guess it's sort of about, but we had a discussion, and I can see any score being okay, depending on the grain of your analysis and where sure. you're starting from. But I'm starting from a point of wanting to fulfill each of these functions in the best way I possibly can. So I guess I'm more focused on some of the differences and the similarities. I see. So looking at differences so you can really work work on those, maybe those gaps, oh, and uh, improve and practice. what they're supposed to be. But I agree. Okay. It's, uh, Robert sure. said it's like a Venn diagram to some extent. There's yes. overlap. Okay. Between okay. Them. So there's no right answer, of course. And it was just, just the way to. <laughs> yes, you were right. You were switching. Okay. 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 I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> so everybody's right. So um, let's, I, I just wanted to get you warmed up a little bit here to think about where mentoring does occur. I mean, that's really. Yeah. And does it occur in a group or individually? Does it occur in a lab setting or in the classroom or just in a private office? Where does it occur? OK, so the next piece is aligning mentor and mentee expectations. Expectations are really important. Sometimes when expectations aren't clearly stated, then that's where the rub is. That's where the problems lie. And I borrow from the work of Steve Lee, who used to be at UC Davis, but now is at Stanford. He moved over to Stanford. OK. Well, I still like him. So Steve um, did this uh, piece. He's a, he's a, I would call him a mentoring expert. And I borrowed some of the things that we're going to be doing in this first half from Steve's work. OK, I didn't have this construct or this framework to, to have this sort of conversation. Steve did. He spent many, many years working on this at Northwestern, then at Davis, now at Stanford. And so. One of the things he says in his mentoring, um, in, in terms of mentoring, is it's important how we define success and to be able to make that really explicit to one another. Mentor and mentee have to really not necessarily agree, but at least say how they define success. And I, I know that this isn't Steve's invention, but there are called, there's, there's something called SMART goals, SMART goals. And you have this on your handout, and I think it's at the bottom the bottom of the first page, SMART goals. Now, what are SMART goals? SMART goals, first of all, are specific. That is, what's the specific goal? Finish your PhD, declare a major, finish your, finish your, your, your bachelor's degree. Those, you know, those are really specific things. And if we clearly articulate that, that's an important start. But then, those goals need to be measurable. And it can't be just this binary thing. You don't have a degree. Now you have a degree. There are many, many milestones in between. And what are the measures? How do you measure progress to the goal? And I think that needs to be made clear. Needs, needs to be made clear. Uh, and there needs to be some sort of agreement of the appropriate measures. Assignability, I think, is important. Who's in charge of what? Is it up to the mentor to lay out you know, the path, to determine the path? to determine how many units per semester or by when should you have X done? Or is it up to the mentee to do that because that mentee's life is full of change and in flux and so on and so forth? Reasonable, can you actually do this in terms of, again, your definition of success? How possible is it? And last but not least, timely. What's the time frame? What's the time for, for undergraduates? Is it a four-year plan or a five and sometimes six or seven or more? What about for a doctoral student? What about, what about for a junior faculty member? You know, what's the time frame we're talking about here and can everybody agree on that? So in terms of setting goals and defining success, it's important to have all of these factors really discussed and identified and to get as much agreement as, as possible. Okay, so that's the definition of success setting sort of the goal, being really clear and explicit about it. Exercise two. All of this work, or these exercises, um, are based, up, based on uh, a questionnaire that Steve Lee put together. And on page three, on the third page, the front and back of the third page, um, he has an inventory. An inventory with pairs of statements. 
and a scale of one to six between those statements. And this is an instrument that Steve uses, and he does workshops on this. Um, and the sort of the overall sort of framework is a concept of mentoring up, where mentees actually help the mentors become better mentors by using this instrument. Mentee and mentor both fill out this instrument, and we're going to be doing a subset of this. And then they compare their responses. And this is in terms of responsibility, in terms of role, in terms of all those sorts of things. So that at least they have a common starting point to have a conversation, OK? Mentoring up. And this is borrowed from business when we talk about um, what supervising or managing up. We help our manager become a better manager. We help our mentor become a better mentor. And this, is, this empowers the mentee. This helps them understand. Um, expectations that they have, and the mentor understand their expectations, the mentee's expecta expectations, and so on. So it's not a contract, but it's a starting point for a conversation. And so on the second page, flip me back to the second full page, you have exercise two. And from all of those 16 or 15, 17, whatever statement pairs, I've pulled out five, five pairs. And why? Because I realize that some of you in here don't have research mentoring responsibilities. And some of these, some of these uh, statement pairs are about research, re research mentee-mentor relationships, OK? So the five here apply across the board. And so what are we going to do with this? For each pair of statements, think of the mentoring you do in your workplace, different contexts, OK, different populations. On a scale of one to six, choose the number that best reflects your position on the continuum between the two statements. Notice that you need to, you need to really focus on integers and don't, don't you know, split. No, 3.754, OK? OK? So you're going to circle. You're going to circle in this, in this worksheet where, where you stand, your score, the position that you take between the two statements. Yes? Well, if, if uh, yeah, so num number one is for the first statement, number six is for the bottom statement, and everything in between, <laughs> okay? Okay. Sorry, I didn't have enough room. I didn't want to take up a lot of paper. But I'll show this up here. So are we ready? Okay, let's do the first one. This is statement pair number two. In an, in an ideal mentoring relationship, mentors should provide close supervision and guidance. If you believe in that, give it a one. And at the other extreme, in an ideal mentoring relationship, mentors should provide much freedom and independence for the mentees to explore and learn themselves. Give that a six if you believe in that or anything in between. OK? Do your score. Yes? I'm having a hard time with this because okay. it's mentoring at different levels. OK. In which this would be, I'd move it up or down. So choose, choose the particular level. Identify graduate student, undergraduate, junior colleague, whatever you want to do. And you'll know what you're doing here. I mean, this is, this is, about, this is about your workplace, your mentee. So whatever type of mentoring we want to focus on. That's, that's up to you. This is more of establishing baseline for you. OK, ready? The next statement. Statement number eight, the mentor should decide how frequently to meet with the mentee. Give that a one if you agree with that strongly. And on the other extreme, the mentee should decide when he or she wants to meet with the mentor. If you believe in that, give it a six or anything in between. OK? Again, think of a particular, your workplace and a particular level of mentoring. The next statement. Statement pair number 11. And the, 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 these numbers refer to Steve's bigger sheet, OK? So you can go back and take a look at those later and what's missing from this analysis. The mentor should be the primary guide for the mentee in their academic and professional goals. And on the other ex extreme, the mentee should gather multiple mentors as they work toward their academic and professional goals. The next one, 
Statement pair 13, the mentor should check regularly that the mentee is working consistently and finishing tasks. And at the other extreme, the mentee should work independently and productively and not have to account for their time. Where do you stand on that continuum? And now the fifth and last one. The mentor is responsible for providing career advice and professional connections. And the other extreme, this is just really too complex, so we need to, we need to refer out and have multiple mentors. OK, so we talked about SMART goals. You've, you've, um, you've thought about a particular mentor-mentee relationship. Uh, you've inventoried sort of where you stand in e between each of these statement pairs. So what I want you to do right now is I want you to, you have, you have uh, let me turn this off. You have post-its, or you should have post-its on your table. I want to see the distribution of your responses. I want to see the distribution of responses. And here we have each of the statement pairs. And what I want you to do is I want you to put your post-it up next to the score that you gave each statement pair. OK, so come on up and just do that, and then go back and take a seat. Wow, what an interesting exercise. Um, I, I, um, when we talk about like-minded individuals, we're, we're kind of uh, all over the place, aren't we? Yeah, you're all here because you care about mentoring, but uh, you know, where, where you are in terms of your perspective, maybe you're thinking about different populations, different settings. Um, you know, maybe you're going back in your personal history as a mentor and thinking about particular individuals and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of qualifications here. Um, Bob, you had a comment that about the sort of the developmental nature. See, that'll teach you to speak to me. I think that, uh, that Lee in the, in the nice complete guide of questionnaire in the back divided into early stages middle stages and advanced stages. I think that's pretty valuable because it will change. But, but my comment was, I don't think that these things as listed are a spectrum. I think they're not mutually exclusive. Yes. And I, I, think I, I think I try to do all of those as a negotiation and a balance. I, I think I should be the primary mentor, but I'm positive they should have other mentors. Okay. So it's not, I don't see it as a, as a spectrum that way. OK. OK. Other, other thoughts about this, that things that came up that maybe you know, this exercise wasn't as clean. Richard. Yeah, as far as what may have already been said, which is the trajectory over time. So on statement pair two, for example, I think ideally you start with fairly intensive mentoring one-on-one, -on -one, but ideally the person would become independent over time. Yes. So it's a sort of a developmental curve. Right, and, and that may be a, a good measure of, of progress, that the person does become more independent and starts making decisions on his or her own. Please, over here. This is, um, this is kind of related to that, but I think it also depends on how much experience either the mentor has with mentoring or the mentee has with being mentored. Yes. Um, because the situation that I was considering when filling this out is um, a mentoring relationship with undergrads who are in their like second semester okay. of undergrad right now. So they may not have been mentored before. So okay. for example, for question 13 or statement pair 13, you know, should they be working independently or should the mentor be checking in with them? That answer is very different for somebody who's brand new to that relationship than somebody who's done it before and maybe has more kind of like um, experience. Yeah. So your, your scores are conditional. Correct. Okay. Anne. I just wanted to echo what, 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 what Bob said about how um, I, th I often felt that both of the statements should be completely true and that as a mentor, for example, number 13, as a mentor, I don't know about regularly checking in, but I should kind of be aware of the progress the mentor, my mentee is making and thinking about it and not forgetting about them in between, okay. but at the same time, letting them work independently and productively and, and you know, so that 
almost like both sides, both the mentor and the mentee should be taking responsibility for the relationship and okay. doing okay. Um, all of these things. Yeah. yeah, in some ways this exercise is a forced choice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Any other comments before we move on? Okay, this, is, this to me is interesting. The multiple mentoring is, is something that I think stands out for many of us. We realize that we don't know everything. Who's in front of us matters, the year in school, but also maybe gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic background. All these factors, it's not a simple sort of plug and play. And uh, yeah. Okay, so let's move on here. Steve also came up with a list of seven core principles regarding the relationship of mentor and mentee, and you have those. You know, most of these are, are, are pretty much self-evident. Um, effective communication, aligning expectations, that's what we've been talking about. Assessing understanding, we haven't really talked about that. How do you know if your mentee understands you and if you understand your mentee? Um, also, addressing equity and inclusion issues uh, and around, around you know, power differential, around just all sorts of things, I identity differences, those, those sorts of things. Uh, fostering independence, we've already kind of referred to that in terms of one, one of those uh, core principles. Uh, promoting professional development, yeah, we've kind of talked about that growth curve and developmental curve and everything in terms of becoming more independent. And also cultivating ethical behavior, we haven't really touched on that, but these are, these are part of what Steve has identified as being some core principles in terms of the relationship. And so what I want you to do right now, and that's on the back of page one, is to just um, indicate, indicate the value of each principle in your mentoring relationship. Think of a particular situation and think about, on a scale of one to six, just how really critical these principles are in your relationship with your mentee. Okay, we're going to start putting all these things together. We're gonna to put together the SMART goals, uh, sort of the you know, role and responsibilities on this continuum, um, and also these, these, these core values in a conversation that you're gonna be having in small groups right now. And the discussion will be driven by the following. Discuss the principles that have high value in helping your mentees realize success. What are some of the high value principles that you've identified, that you've given a five or six, okay? But related to that is, what about your mentoring approach helps you and your mentee fulfill these high value principles, okay? I mean, you've already made some choices on the continuum between those pairs of statements. And finally, what are the challenges or barriers to fulfilling them for you as a mentor? That is for you to actually make this happen. And what about for mentees? What are some of the challenges or barriers in the relationship that may in fact get in the way to realize these high value principles? Any questions before you start talking? Okay. So, was there anything big that came out of your conversation around challenges, around uh, you know, um, you know, how this fits with, with your reality? Over here, did you have some, in, anything that, uh, I thought I read, I read some, some something. <laughs> or was I just making that up? No, we had a lively discussion. Okay, <laughs> okay, thank you for sharing. <laughs> okay. does, anybody, does anybody want to report out something? Sheila, please. Oh, oh. I think we were making the distinction between <clears throat> the components that you've enumerated that are aspects of mentoring and actually dubbing a person with the magical term of mentor. Yes. And ah. so, you know, we were talking about scale and gradations and interactions and whether a student whom you've helped as an advocate over a long term, as somebody here did with appeals and getting okay. admitted, the student wouldn't think of you as a mentor, probably. I see. But does that make a difference? No. I mean... Got it. Okay. Any other, any other insights? I think what's, what's coming out for me doing this is that instead of thinking of myself as a, um, a, 
a permanent mentor in my role. It's like I have uh, moments and, and pieces of mentorship. Yes. And they're not necessarily long lasting always, but I will work with somebody and I know that I did some really great mentoring for a situation, but that doesn't necessarily continue after that. So that's what sort of I, I'm working it out, you know, going okay. through these exercises. And yeah. it's interesting to think about. Good. Thank you. Mika. I thought an interesting thing that came up, is it Sean? Sean, that Sean brought up was, um, this says fostering independence as a goal, but in some cases you might want to be fostering ability to collaborate and to be more in connection. Oh, that's interesting. And so okay. I, there's some embeddedness in here of the value system of the current system, which is that this person's going to become more... An individual. Uh, an individual who doesn't need any help from anybody, whereas we're living in a world now where being able to collaborate and work with okay. others and all that might be a really okay. great thing. So just an observation that maybe So maybe a cultural bias that's embedded. a cultural embedded. bias embedded in Okay, it, yeah. Ve very interesting. In the back here. There you go. So I totally concur with that. Um, what I would like to substitute is fostering ability to take initiative uh -huh. rather than the Lone Ranger scientist okay. going off uh -huh. half-cocked. But I very much resonate okay. with the developing ability to collaborate. Okay. And I think that's more than communication. Very interesting. In Behind you. Anybody from this side? Please. We had a conversation about sort of the values that inform effective mentorship, which we weren't sure whether they fit in one of these categories or were sort of wrapped around. Okay. Things like being supportive and encouraging, building confidence. I mean, it sort of goes without saying, but I think it's worth stating that uh, mentoring should be a positive experience. I see. Uh, it's not a tearing down or... You, it's mm -hmm. so... Um, and listening, building rapport making people feel yeah. welcome, all yeah. of those okay. pieces. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? One more, yeah. and then we'll move on. Please, right in the middle here. Um, we were talking about the layers of sort of power privilege yeah. positioning and the identities and cultures and how that really impacts the effectiveness of a mentor-mentee relationship. And these questions you know, are focusing on like what we want the mentees to be able to realize and do, but mentors have to equally be able to do that and understand what what's my position here, what's my privilege here, where yes. are my blind spots, and move forward in a way that there is a sense of uh, a leveling off between the two, yes. that, that you're empowering the mentee to also understand like you bring a lot of value to this. I'm not this mentor that's all the way up here. How about that? Um, yeah. So, but it's, you know, I gave the example that if I was mentored, sort of in my past being mentored by a white male, it's very different if I'm mentored by a woman of color. And those dynamics are just important to bring to the table. Thank you. And this is a great segue into the BSP approach. Okay? And so we're going to turn the corner here. So uh, you've been a sort of establishing baseline here. You've been assessing you know, any number of things about yourselves. You've shared those things. You've talked about the complexity of the mentor-mentee relationship um, and, and so on and so forth. So let's turn the corner and build on them. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be building on, hopefully we'll be able to add some value to the conversations thus far and maybe your experience thus far by considering BSP. What is the secret sauce of BSP? You know, what have we been doing over these last 26 years in advising, mentoring, and teaching that, in fact, may be related to the student outcomes that you saw earlier? So these are four of any number, a myriad of things that we take into consideration as we advise, teach, and mentor within BSP. Institutional climate. Let me make a statement here. We work to counter the negative impact of institutional climate on our students. The university, not uniformly, but there are spaces at the university that are hostile. Spaces where students don't feel safe or welcomed, where they feel like they don't belong. And Mika Estrada, 
a social psychologist from UCSF and close friend of mine. She and I and uh, another colleague, uh, Allegra, wrote a paper last year on kindness and STEM. Wow, those two words, STEM and kindness, you know, how often do we hear those two words mentioned in the same breath? But Mika and I were sitting in my office one day, and this was one of those back of the envelope things where we were trying to capture, we're trying to capture uh, students' experiences as they engaged with different aspects of the university. We tried to capture sort of the development going from an exclusive to an inclusive institutional environment, and we came up with this. A prejudiced institutional environment on the left has both high macro and micro aggression. It's really clear that you're not wanted. We don't want you, says the billboard. And in every interaction around teaching, mentoring, advising, it's made really clear. We do not want you. You do not belong here. You're not welcome. What are you doing here? Okay? That's a prejudiced institutional environment. An inclusive institutional environment on the other extreme has high macro and high micro affirmation. Okay? The billboard reads, you're welcome. And in every single interaction, there's affirmation. When I'm one-on-one, -on -one, when, when you're in class, you raise your hand, I acknowledge you, even though your question may not be relevant to what we were talking about, we find a way to include you, to acknowledge you, the fact that you're adding value to the experience. So we go from one extreme to the other, and the question is, where is UC Berkeley on this continuum? I would say we're right in the middle. We have, we have high microaggression and high macro affirmation. What do I mean by that? Diversity and excellence. Excellence and diversity. That's what the billboard reads, right? Excellence and diversity. But in many of the interactions that students have described to us, like in mentoring, teaching, and advising interactions, there's also high microaggression. Oh, you got to see in general chemistry, you don't belong in STEM. Try something that is more suitable to your aptitude. Okay, one grade, single data point, not good science, no idea about what was behind the C, what high school, what was it like? Oh, that 10th grade course that you took was taught by somebody who just read out of the book, and that was the last time you took chemistry. Hmm, you got to see what an amazing performance after having come, and maybe you didn't get your textbook until the 10th week of class because your financial aid didn't get in. So you're working with 10 weeks without a textbook. Okay, what an amazing person. So what I'm saying is that I want us to think about, I want us to think about the institutional context and how it really does impact our students. In asking students where do they feel safe, they can name those places off on campus. The buildings, the programs, the people. They can also name off those places and spaces where they do not feel safe. They do not feel wanted. And in a trusting relationship, they will talk about those things. And so let's make sure that we're cognizant of this as we enter into the relationship of mentor-mentee, that students are really affected by the climate in different spaces on this campus. So that's one thing that we think about. Another thing that we think about is mentoring across differences. And we talked a little bit about that, right? In fact, you brought that up about being mentored by uh, a white male versus a woman of color. I mean, that's a, that's a different experience for you. And so the fact is, is that, you know, we have this question, how do we talk, listen, and understand across differences in our backgrounds and lived experiences? We can't be everything to everybody. <laughs> I mean, we each have our own uh, histories, our life histories, our backgrounds. Um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, there's a power differential. We, speak, we, we look at situations from different vantage points, all of those sorts of things. And so how do we do that? How do we do that? Because there may be a big mismatch between who you are and who they are. And so in the intercultural communications literature, I, I searched this out because I was really wondering, really, what are we doing in BSP that, that works? I'm not black or brown. I'm not female. 
Okay? But we are working predominantly with black and brown students, a large majority of whom are female. How have I been able to do that? Well, I was searching, I was searching for a framework, a conceptual framework for me to understand what I might be doing. And so I found this one thing. And in fact, it was funny because Tervalon, Melanie Tervalon is a friend of mine, African-American woman who got her MD at UCSF. And she and a colleague wrote this article on cultural competence versus cultural humility a long time ago. Nowadays, cultural competence is something that is taught in medical school. Right? We want you to be culturally competent. We want you to understand the culture of your patients. And so it's kind of off to the side, but it's becoming more integrated because if you don't understand culture, how can you help treat the whole person? Okay? But competence is kind of a loaded term. It implies an endpoint, right? You reach this, you cross this line and you become competent. You know what there is to know about the other. So that's problematic because how, how uniform is any group, okay? It's impossible to know. There's greater variation within a group than between groups. And we know this from, from, um, from any number of, of, of sources. And so rather, Melanie and her, and her colleague came up with the term cultural humility. Maybe they didn't come up with it, but they really emphasized this. Humility. Humility means that you can never know everything about the other. That person that's sitting in front of you, and when they walk up, you just can't say, oh, I know about your group. I've read about them. I know you. Overgeneralizing, stereotyping, whatever you want to call it. And so humility says that there's more to learn. And the way we approach this is by considering the second pair of the second comparison. Empathy versus the third space. This is something. We talk about empathy, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes, right? I put myself in your shoes. You put yourself in mine. And we understand each other. Empathy is an impossibility. Let me, tell you, let me give you an example of this. There are a number of women in this, in this workshop. What if I said to you, I know what it's like to be a woman? <laughs> wait, 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 I really do. I've read all about you, and even in some high-impact peer-reviewed journals, and I know about you. In fact, some of my best friends are women. <laughs> How offensive is that? I know about you. I can empathize. I can put myself in your shoes. No way is that possible, nor can you understand completely what it's like to be a man. Okay? Empathy is something that is not possible. So instead, there's an alternative, and this is proposed by Broom in Communication Education, again, many, many years ago, and I found this. I found this, I found this article, and I thought, this makes sense to me. It's called Third Space. I can never know what it's like to be a woman. You can never know what it's like to be a man. But we can build this third space between us where we can begin to talk about our experiences. We can negotiate understandings. We can share things about ourselves without assuming we can completely know about the other. I think BSP is a third space. I think we create a third space where people from different backgrounds come together because it's a, an environment of trust, authenticity, those sorts of things where we can actually share with one another and build this third space and not assume that we could ever know everything that there is to know about somebody who comes from a different background. And so think about that as you're mentoring. Think about that as you're teaching. Think about that as you're advising. So that's the second thing. STEM talent. Here's another lens. Another, another important uh, way that I think we, we have, um, we've have fostered, fostered student success. Our goal, and I said this earlier, is to enlarge and diversify the talent pool versus sim simply skimming talent, OK? We don't say, you're not a 4.0, so you're not in the program. You, you know, your SATs are horrible, you're not in the program. There's no threshold based upon the standard metrics of success. And how do we do this? How do we actually, um, um, uh, how, do we, how do we act on this? That is to de develop talent versus skimming talent. 
in red is the BSP approach. In black is what I've noticed here and elsewhere, and maybe this is part of what is mostly done in the STEM environment. Talent search. What's your GPA? OK, you're fine. You can join my lab. What's your GPA? OK, you're fine. You're my lab partner now in, in, in uh, organic chemistry. In other words, we search for talent and we skim. BSP develops talent. And you saw the stats, the background. Students in BSP are undervalued because they are judged by their scores, their GPAs, and, and so on initially. But you saw that the gap closes given the right environment. That's one thing. Another approach that we used is we have a growth mindset. And this is both for ourselves and our students. The fixed mindset is you are your GPA. Okay? Those numbers don't lie. I don't need to know anything more about you but your GPA and your SATs because, you know, it's kind of like choosing athletes. You just look at performance and you can therefore say that that person, and you don't take into consideration training, opportunity, access, information, you know, life circumstances, you just say, you know, you can shoot the ball, you can jump high, you can do all, you can hit home runs. No. Academics is not that simple, and we all know that in this room. You wouldn't be here if you thought, oh, it's just simple, you know, mentoring, just get the best and really work with them. This growth mindset is, on our part, we need to get the story behind the numbers. We need to learn more. That's that humility piece. We need to learn more about who's in front of us. We need to create those spaces and opportunities to, to actually get more information so that we can begin to figure out how we can co-construct success. It's not me doing too, but it's me working with. But wait, let me back up. The growth mindset, students also oftentimes define themselves based on their GPA. Oh, I'm a 2.4. I'm a 2.4 versus my GPA is 2.4. And in terms of mentoring and breaking that down is what were the factors that led to that 2.4? What do you have control over? What's beyond your control? Oh, you're working within a four-year time frame. Maybe you should extend that time frame. You know, those sorts of conversation. So help students adopt the growth mindset. Deficit-based versus strength-based. What do students bring versus what they don't have? Dominant culture thinking is, you know, you don't have. You haven't taken this course. Your GPA is too low. You know, you need to do better first. Well, some of those things may be true, but what do they bring? Oftentimes, we do not take the time to assess. We do not create that third space so that people could explain circumstance and also offer up what they can add, what value they can add to a situation, a study group, as a lab partner, in a laboratory, in a classroom, what, whatever. Success to date. Looking at the transcript, oh, a C in general chemistry and organic, organic chemistry to something more suited to your aptitude versus, you know, what is your potential? How do you measure potential? Oftentimes, we look at starting point. We get, we try to get the backstory. What was the high school like? What were the opportunities like? How many hours a week did you have to work? Oh, you had family responsibilities as you were, and maybe you still do. Oh, you commute two hours a day each way because you have to live at home. It's all these sorts of things. Um, there's a, this, this idea of starting point and looking for potential is something that Billy Bean and the Oakland A's do. They look at undervalued, not underprepared, but undervalued players. And they work with them in a way that they become the all-stars that the New York Yankees can just buy up. <laughs> OK. You like that, huh, Bob? Yeah. <laughs> OK. OK. So starting points, and not to say that your current record is really a re reflection of your potential. Traditional clock versus personal clock, four-year plan, five-year normative time to a PhD, all these sorts of things. You may have to be on a different personal clock because of your starting point. 
maybe it's going to take longer because you have to take the courses that maybe your undergraduate institution did not you know, provide really, um, maybe these weren't courses that were really, that helped prepared you for graduate level work at Berkeley. Or as an undergraduate, you went to a high school where maybe the general chemistry or the chemistry was taught in such a way it was just memorization without deep understanding or application or integration. And so your personal clock, and I know this is a rough one around financial aid, around time, time you know, all that sort of stuff. But we have worked with our students in, in that way over the last 26 years in our mentoring, advising, and our teaching. And here's a really important one, plan B versus pathway B. Plan B is oftentimes what we conclude. You need to do something else because of your grades. You need to do something else because you know, your performance really doesn't align with your aspirations. Um, just a couple of weeks ago, there was a professor, African-American professor, neurobiologist from UCSD. I don't know how many of you were at that talk. Gentry Patrick, yeah. Gentry went to, went to school at Berkeley. Okay? He graduated with a 2.4. 2.4, and today he's a full professor at UCSD, neuro, neuroscientist, and so on. Somebody saw the potential in him. And rather than saying, oh, you need to do something else, they found a pathway B. He did a post back program, he did research, he was mentored by some real high flyers, and now he's, uh, he's doing science at UCSD, okay? 2.4 out of Berkeley. Number four, mentor caveats, okay? Let the mentee beware. So, I've created a number of categories, a number of categories that in fact, um, th these are of, through observation and through conversation with my students over the years. And so I find that mentors fall into any number of Categories, and here are the names that I give them, these categories. Cheerleader. Some mentors go, you can do it. I believe in you. That's great. We all need cheerleaders in our lives, right? For emotional support. You know, sometimes our families are those cheerleaders, uh, friends, but they don't have the concretes in terms of how to help you do it. But they believe in you. They love you. They want to support you. We need them. Bless them. Gatekeepers. No, not you, your GPA, your SAT, your GRE, your 2.4 out of Berkeley, okay? Gatekeepers, their job, and I've heard this said before, I'm only telling you for your own good, okay? You need to choose something else rather than knowing the full story behind that 2.4. And for those of you that heard Gentry, you know his fuller story. Mercenaries, this is probably the worst category. And this is my name for some, some, and there are some mercenaries on this campus. Your presence is to help them build portfolio. They wanna count you so they can say they broaden participation. So they have, they have underrepresented ethnic minorities in their lab, they mentor, they do all these sorts of things but they want to use you without knowing about you. Let the mentee beware. And the last thing, the last category is coach. And this is the one that I believe we've been doing in BSP. And what does a coach do? A coach, along with the mentee, co-assesses where the mentee is, where he or she wants to be, and co-develops a personalized plan to get there. That's what good coaches do. That's what good coaches do, whether the coaching be in a performing arts and sports, academically, and so on. And I believe that over all these years, we've been coaching people. We haven't been deciding for people, but we were co-creating and leaving the decision up to, up to the mentee, the advisee, the person in the class, and so on. Now, I say this with some qualification. There are some situations where you do have to be really directive. When when there may be some extreme mental health issues where the person is going to hurt him or herself, and, and so on, okay? But short of that, 
we've left the decision and we've co-created with the mentee. And so I'm going to start, stop talking and open the floor up to anything you want to talk about. What is it that's on your mind? What is it, what questions do you have? Where do you want to go deeper? Please, and the microphone here. Thank you, oh, Camila. <laughs> um, so I have a question going back to the key BSP approaches that you just mentioned. Yeah. So like talent starts versus talent development and those, the rest of them. Um, I'm curious what, um, how do you talk to students about those distinctions if the student is sort of feeling stuck in the fixed mindset or the plan B idea. So even if you as the advisor, mentor, teacher, coach are trying to help them understand this alternative perspective, they're still kind of stuck in the sort of conventional sure. lack of a better term mindset. How sure. do you deal with that? Cam Camila, would you feel comfortable responding to that question? Cam this, this is Camila. She's one of our, she is our BSP advisor. If you don't feel comfortable, just say so. Yeah, I can. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Camila Moreno, I'm BSP program advisor. Um, so in those cases, I think it's important to have a conversation with the student and just allow them to reflect upon their own um, vision of themselves and so really walk through that conversation and pinpoint those elements that you've talked about already like I'm I'm listening to you and this is what I'm hearing um, and so what do you think about that so kind of turning it on them and being able to reflect with them in that situation um, because often students come to you for the answer, but in reality, they have the own answers themselves. And so something that I often tell students is, you know yourself better than anybody else. And if this is something that you're comfortable in exploring, you can try it out. And if it doesn't work out, we can come back together and we can strategize towards building a new plan. So, Camila, is that mentoring or advising? Uh -huh. That's both, it, I yeah, think. Yeah, it kind of sounds like both, doesn't for it? For me, yeah, yeah, it's a mix always for me. I think also it's very important of thinking of yourself as a femtor or a mentor um, to really understand <laughs> that they're teaching you as much as you're teaching them. How about that? Thank you. Other questions? Please. Hi, so um, I'm coming from a different institution. Thank you for having well, me Why here. don't you identify that? Um, I'm Stella Hine from uh, UC Santa Cruz, and I um, asked if I could come here today because I'm developing a small uh, peer mentoring program and STEM success program for students, uh, coming, incoming students. And I'm curious about, uh, I do a bit of mentoring myself, teaching, but also you know directly with students. and. I'm curious about how to facilitate effective, uh, effective communication and mentoring between peer mentors, so undergraduate students who I want to bring into the program with undergraduates that they would then be mentoring. Okay, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask our BSPs, if, if Yesenia and Glendy, if you're comfortable, here are our two peer mentors in BSP, Yesenia and Glendy. And, and the question is how... Just, uh, sorry. If you're leaving early, can you please fill out your evaluation before you walk out the door? Yeah. I would really, really appreciate it. Yes, please. Yes. Th th thanks, Mika. Thank you. So, Yesenia and Glendy, uh, what do you think about the question? The question is how do, you pr how do you work with peer advisors, peer mentors? When you're not directly there. When you're not directly there. How do you prepare peer advisors, peer mentors, to actually function in, in, in an effective way. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Yesenia. I think I've been prepared for this job since my first day at BSP. Um, at BSP, we center the focus on students, provide them with the power, and I guess the agency to decide where the community goes and what decisions are made. So coming into the job, I knew that's what the students had in mind. So I feel that BSP prepares its peer advisors by letting them know 
what what type of agency the students themselves have and what agency you have as both a peer and like a student and a staff to relay and to be a liaison between staff and students, but still fulfilling your position as a student while still having agency as a staff, but letting the students know that not ju just because they're not peer advisors, that doesn't mean they don't have agency within what happens in the BSP community. And so is, is the message, if you come up through the community, then you have a really good sense of how to work with the community. Yeah, so I guess just letting your peer advisors know that them as an individual have this agency to the community that they can engage them into. Glenn, did you have anything more to add? Uh, basically what she said. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> ditto. Got it, got it. Please, David. Uh, I was wondering, in light of Gentry Patrick's um, program at UCSD and comparing to BSP um, versus Meyerhoff and where how these things fall on this skimming versus talent development and and the impression I got from Jennifer Patrick's thing is very resource intensive, very small numbers. You started with small numbers and now it's really scaled to an amazing degree. And maybe to reflect on that. Yeah, I, I, you know, and this, this is something that Mika and I are gonna actually do a presentation along with a colleague from Iowa State University who used to be with BSP. He was the research coordinator, Corey, you know, Corey Welch, yeah. And so, you know, the question is, do we develop or skim STEM talent? Okay, clearly we're developing STEM talent because we don't ask, you know, what's your GPA and all that sort of stuff. We look for other qualities. And we'll, if you wanna know more about that, we can, we can talk about what we look for. But I think, and, and Mika and I had a meeting yesterday and we were really thinking about how to, how to frame what we were doing and why developing talent maybe is more cost effective than skimming and paying a lot of money. For example, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a new program that's gonna, be, that's gonna kick off here at Berkeley and the cost is $20,000 per student per year because there's a stipend and everything like that. And it is skimming because it's looking for you know, high SATs, GPAs, you know, the all-stars, qualified, qualified for STEM people. Um, my students would not be viewed as qualified for STEM based on their scores, right? So our, our program costs $2,000 per student per year. 2,000, and we get those results, those results that, and in fact, um, just last year, four of four BSPers took faculty positions in the in the Bay Area. Um, two two at uh, UC Davis, one at UCSF, and one at Stanford. And these were students who weren't expected to make it in science. That's kind of like the Gentry Patrick story, right? Okay. And so we were really thinking, and in our conversation, we were really thinking about 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 how to really capture, besides the money piece, but related to the money. So the whole idea of a return on investment, I think is really, really important. In other words, we invest $2,000 per student and we get the results that you see versus $20,000 per student and probably they'll get results too. But if you were to make a choice in terms of investing limited resources, what would you invest in? Okay? And also value added. Historically, how did students from the background that BSPers come from, how did they do? And what's the delta between how they historically have done that, people from that background, versus how BSPers do? And that delta is the value that's added, the institutional value within this context. And so, yeah, and so what we're trying to do with EUSS, Expanding under, Undergraduate Success in STEM, is we're trying to disseminate, as we're, we're talking about this, sort of some of the BSP practices, of course, with heavily, heavy uh, adaptation, modification, application, because not all of our settings are the same, okay? And so we're trying to leverage what we know and help others become, you know, add value to what they do as well. And so, again, that $2,000 per student per year, maybe, you know, the value, in, the value added goes way up if others begin to work with students from similar backgrounds in an effective way. Mika, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think you said it well. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> okay. Other, other comments, questions? Please, right there. 
what advice would you have? I mean, I'm, I'm an advisor. I, I have sort of limited influence on my students. So what advice would you give to someone in my position to help influence our faculty to adopt some of these changes, these mindsets that you've found okay. so successful? Okay. So oftentimes faculty, and some of them are in the room here, they're at every single event around, you know, closing equity gaps and so on. So they do it for very personal reasons. Okay, so, you know, if we triage the situation, there are those on that end. There are those who would never go to anything like this because this is a waste of time because I know about success. We get the best and we invest in them. But I'm looking at the in-between folks. And oftentimes the in-between folks don't make a move toward, toward the, um, you know, towards um, being more proactive and you know, doing things like this because they don't have the resources, because the reward structure isn't there. Career, you know, career advancement, this does not count. I mean, yeah, service, but you know, in the hierarchy of you know, the three things that faculty have to do, no, no, okay? And so we have to provide support to lower the activation energy for people to become much more engaged and active. And so the support, and that's why I'm, you know, I'm, I'm doing these workshops, um, Meek and I, Want to start? Um, you want to talk about the center that we're thinking about starting? Um, uh, we have this idea that there's a, actually a lot that's going well, that is being done that's well. There's a lot of research that informs good practices and that it's often not accessible, easily accessible to people who are starting training programs, science training programs, STEM training programs, uh, curriculum change activities and stuff. And so uh, we have this idea of starting a center that would have these kind of resources available and also to leverage the, what has been learned through BSP and um, make it more available to the community here at UC Berkeley and uh, when people are interested even beyond this area. But to, you know, John at some point will retire. I don't know at what point he'll do that, but I, there's a lot of knowledge and experience that we want to make sure uh, gets institutionalized in a way that can be accessible to lots of other people. And pairing that experience and on the ground um, knowledge with what do we know from the science of education and from social sciences and from, from best practices in the classroom and curriculum change stuff? Like, can we put that all in one place so that people don't have to make it up every time they do it? So we have to make it easier for those with the will find the way to, you know, to become activated in, in, in that respect. And so I think that's really, really important. But I also think you know, there are other structural things that we need to do. And, there, and Mika taught me this term, but um, the, the WIFM, W-I-F-M, what's in it for me? What's in it for me to change? So we have to find high impact, low effort ways for all faculty to participate. And then when we get into the higher effort associated with high impact, we have to make that yet easier, maybe through a center. And so again, lower lower the amount of effort that it's going to take for an interested person from across all the roles in the university to access those resources. And I'm not, going, I'm not talking about going to the primary social science literature. That stuff is dense. And we're not trained to read that and to translate that into actionable um, you know, interventions, efforts. And so we need to change the structure of the university, maybe even the reward system for uh, career advancement. Okay. Other comments, other questions, please. Is there any chance that, uh, just building on Amanda's question, um, any chance that um, early career faculty, uh, some of it that emerged in our discussion here is awareness, awareness of these important values of implicit bias, of um, empathy versus uh, humility. Thir empathy humility. Thir um, can this be a kind of, I don't know if the word mandatory applies to faculty ever, but for early career um, incoming faculty, just awareness could probably make a huge difference. A workshop or three workshops. I, I understand. And so this is something that you know, we, we, we should strongly consider. And if we had this inclusive excellence resource center, this is what 
Meek and I have named this aspiration that we have so that the, we can make the institution more inclusively excellent. Uh, you know, we can make that available. And you know Berkeley, I mean, we're, there, there's so much going on. I mean, so we're research, resource rich, but everything is dispersed and sometimes it's hard to tap into those resources un, unless you're sort of in the loop, unless you're part of the network, unless we make it easier. Um, Sheila. Oh, I was um, a group of uh, students in the best Berkeley tradition, women graduate students, adopted the Google uh, implicit bias um, workshop stuff about two years ago. And they uh, now there's mandatory, I mean mandatory in the sense that there's a mandatory orientation for new engineering faculty at any level, even if they're hired with tenure. And the implicit bias team, uh, it was men and women, but most, you know, <clears throat> the students are, you know, very diverse group, give this implicit work bias workshop. And so. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a model. <clears throat> it's a model. Yes. Is Angie, is Angie still here? No, she isn't. She, she left. I was going to just say, that when yeah. you talked about the WIFM, what's in it for me, that comes from uh, communications specialists on how you communicate to people. So you should always know what the WIFM is for your audience. And in this case, the audience is the faculty. And is that what's in it for me? Is it different for people who are incoming faculty versus people who have been here for five years or 10 years or 20 years? There might be different ways in which you would want to approach it differently depending upon those different groups um, because they are going to have different things that are important to them. So with any type of huge kind of systemic changes like this, you have to know who your audience is and, and, and what's important to them. And in some cases, the institution has ability to leverage and to change what's important by what they count for um, promotion, right? That's like the biggest leverage piece from the higher level. So those are lots of different things to discuss, but there's, there is examples, lots of examples of what works. And we, I, I just think that we have to get to a point where we're not making it up every time that yeah. we can somehow harness what we know and build on it as opposed to you know, starting all over again <laughs> each time. And as somebody who's a social scientist who doesn't do um, the kind of on the ground, boots to the ground type of research at a lab, I work with a lot of scientists who are just amazed that there's all this other knowledge out there. They don't even know that, that there's BSP exists. You know, they're trying to make up their own program because they don't know. So, um, so there's opportunity there, I think. Anything else? So maybe this is a good stopping point. Just want to thank you all for being here and investing your valuable time in this workshop. Thank you very much. <laughs>